Good afternoon. My name is John O'Meara. I'm the director of the Marketing Intelligence Program here at USF. At our School of Management, we're training the next generation of strategic problem solvers with quantitative and qualitative skills that will equip them for successful careers in marketing research, analytics, and insights across a range of industries. Today, we're fortunate to have a real pro in the field of marketing research, Eric Rat Rasmussen, join us today for a discussion on the power of insights. For those less familiar with Eric, he's the head of CI at 23andMe, the first company to offer autosomal DNA testing for that ancestry, which is today's industry standard. Prior to joining 23andMe, Eric has had an accomplished career, holding leadership roles at Silicon Valley stalwarts like Yahoo, eBay, Shutterfly, and Groupon. This afternoon, we have the opportunity to gain further insights into the field of marketing and perhaps even get a glimpse into the future. Eric, welcome. We're happy to have you today. Thanks so much, John. Looking forward to it. Um, let's see. Eric, I think you know today joining us um, with our conversation, even though you and I will be doing the back and forth, we have um, current students, uh, a fair number of graduate students who are studying the field of marketing research and insights. And so I know they're really eager to hear um, some of your career. But before we get into that, I just have to ask you, as someone that works at 23andMe, have you ever done a test, your own ancestry test, and did you learn anything new? As, that's a great question, actually. Um, and the answer is yes. In fact, um, you have to drink the Kool-Aid. So when you are um, join at 23andMe, they actually give you two different tests. So I was able to give one for my wife, who ironically, she actually worked at 23andMe before I did. Um, and did we discover new things? Um, yeah, you know, my family is kind of a mix. I'm one side, my dad's side, we're third generation Californian. Um, and the other side of the family is from basically my mom's side is from the Azor Islands, which is a real melting pot because it's out in the middle of the Atlantic. And um, yeah, family name is Jacques, to which my family always said, well, we're Portuguese. And I'm like, Jacques sounds pretty French to me. And <laughs> sure enough, the uh, DNA shows up that there's a lot of French in there. So um, it's fascinating stuff. Yeah, interesting. Very cool. Well, how about this? Let's back up some. And prior to joining 23andMe, um, we know you started your early career in marketing research for companies like GoTo, and then eventually taking on increasingly larger roles and responsibilities for companies like Yahoo, then eBay, as I mentioned before, Shutterfly and Groupon. Um, you've had a lot of accomplishments in your career. Is there, um, can I ask you for a second to think back and is there maybe you know one, one challenge, one pretty cool question or, or um, initiative that you were able, you and your team were able to drill into and, and maybe share a little bit of that with us? Um, there are so many um, going back. And I would even say my career before I got into the whole Silicon Valley thing started, this is really date, predating all that. Um, I started off in television research, which is a whole another kind of interesting, crazy um, segment of the kind of consumer insights um, business. Uh, but anyway, the same kind, many of the same principles apply because what you, what brings a viewer back to watch a television program week by week is very similar to the same kinds of psychology and other ways of understanding the consumer base that you would apply for e-commerce, which is really where I spent most of my time. Um, but specifically to your question, they've all been different kinds of questions. Um, I worked on this giant project while I was doing the television research thing where we were actually, and this is an interesting question that I would pose for those of you researchers out there. We were posed with a challenge. This is back, this is going back in the, the mid nineties when probably most of these students were in grammar school, but um, it was, how do we get more programs onto through a um, cable wire? So in other words, they had, um, this is back in the days of where everything was cable and it was about compression. And what we were tasked with was to find out what you could um, bring it down to as far as degradation of both the picture as well as the audio, the sound and the picture quality before it reached the level of human perception. 
So how far could they degrade it and then be able to put more programming into each of those? And uh, I won't bore you with the details, but we set up this elaborate study taking all of these different hit movies that because we were working with all of this conglomeration of uh, telecom as well as movies uh, and television. Um, so we got all these and then clipped them down into like 20 second bits. And then we had this whole algorithm where we were testing these in front of people until they finally start saying like, you know what, the sound wasn't great on that. And we're anyway, fascinating, but that became the standard for what is still used right now, as far as where humans can perceive like, and eh, I, I don't think that's as good. Um, so that's a that jumps out right at, uh, when we were talking about uh, what are some of the big challenges that we tackled. So that's an early one I can talk about. And then every every company, and it seems like every week we're tackling something new. Well, actually, that's uh, really really interesting. And even though it seems like uh, that was so long ago, it really wasn't that many years ago, right? Um, as you think um, over, you've worked not only in research in the television industry, in early technology in Silicon Valley, and then now look at the kind of company you're at today. Um, can you spot some common threads or major changes over the course of your career? What are maybe, what are one or two of the biggest changes you've seen in the field of marketing research and insights? Or if, the, if you don't see changes, then what are the constants that never seem to go away? Yeah, I, well, I'll start off with the constants because um, no company ever hires you because you're not needed. And typically, um, when they're looking for a consumer insights professional, it's one of two things. They've either progressed in such a way that they are now um, like, okay, they're looking around, well, we need some people here and doing this and that. And I'll, I'll actually give an example for you there. And uh, this is going back to Groupon, where I, this is 10 years ago, roughly. Um, it was the fastest growing company. And it was a great example of having a founder at the helm still and everyone telling them, you're the greatest, you're doing everything awesome. And he's actually a very smart guy, um, lives in San Francisco now. Um, but he his idea was that we're so cool. We know this stuff. And I know the customer that I don't even need a marketing team. I don't need market research. I don't need any of these things. And um, so with that hubris comes mistakes and they did a big, um, I don't know if you guys remember, this was a Super Bowl ad without any market research, without any of this kind of stuff. And it ended up offending everyone. And it's still every year that comes around when there's like, oh, the Super Bowl ads, let's look at some of the ones that bombed. It's still on that reel of, of terrible ones. Anyway, so that was a case where after that, they're like, okay, we need to have some marketing people here. We need to get a consumer insights. And that's when I was uh, recruited into that and had to build up a team. And that's another constant. Anytime you go into a role, it's not like, you know, we were thinking about having someone here and I don't know, what do you want to do? No, you come in day one. They're like, we've got six months to nine months of backlogged requests and you're going to be buried in work for the next, you know, that's just the way it's going to be. So that's a constant. Um, the good news is it's always great to be the fireman when there's a fire. You're needed and everybody wants you. <laughs> um, so that's a great thing, but um, be prepared that, um, and also you should have that attitude when people are interviewing you on this um, type of environment, they're always going to want to hear that, yes, I'm the person who's going to come here and solve your problems because I can tell you all of these different things about your customer, about potential customers, about where you should be expanding, about what your product's um, problems are. Um, so I'd say that that's constant. I'd also say, especially in Silicon Valley, because there's so many founders that are still running the company that you always have to worry about um, uh, diplomacy. And I would say that that's a truism of this role is that it's one where you get tremendous amounts of responsibility. You're expected in so many ways to kind of guide the ship. Where is this company going? Where is this product? What is our whole reason for being and yet you get no responsibility. So you can go out and find out all those things and then you have to tell everybody about it, but you have no authority to say like, this is the way we're gonna go and that's why. Um, you're basically an advisor. So if you haven't honed your skills on diplomacy and get them to feel like they're coming along on the journey and coming to that realization at the same time, you're, you're gonna have an uphill battle. You're gonna have a lot of challenges and probably fail. And as I always say, the, the consumer insights team is the one on the team that can tell you that your baby is ugly. 
And you need that person to be able to tell you, but you have to say it in a nice way. You can't say your baby is ugly. You say, you know, the baby's got great eyes, but I think if we put a softer lens on it, it'll do much better in these photos or what, however you're going to phrase it, but you get my analogy there. We absolutely get it. Those are some of the um, constants as you look over your career and your, the, the broader profession of marketing research and insights over your career. Um, maybe what are some of the biggest changes that, that you've seen occurring? Yeah. Um, so I, I would say the biggest one, and I would anticipate this is going to continue is uh, let's, so when I started learning um, research and how to work with clients and things like that, it was in uh you know, it wasn't in the stone age, but still, you know, setting up from someone saying, Hey, I think we need to find out about what the consumers are thinking on this or that you had a good, you know, two months of kind of anticipation time set up, da, 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 actually doing the research and then returning back with results. And especially with Silicon Valley, um, that time frame has just shrunk down to where they're almost, they're almost expecting immediate results. Um, and that is a challenge because I think one of the things that happens in the time compression is a compromise in some of the quality. Um, so I'd say that that's number one. And I think that you have to um, find a balance between doing a great academic study that takes six months and is perfect in so many kind of pure and uh, in an academic sense. Um, because in Silicon Valley, if you're doing and delivering things on a long timeline, they'd be like, Hey, that's great, but we've already moved on. We had to make the decision two months ago while you were still working on this. So you're now making yourself irrelevant. Um, and you never want to be seen that way because oftentimes then they're going to make decisions without ever talking to you. It's just going to be like, yeah, we call up Eric, but God, he just takes forever to come back with any useful information. So let's just skip it and we'll do our own thing. And that's always a disaster. Well, you know, uh, first of all, time and time crunch, uh, I hear it and is getting uh, briefer and briefer, always a challenge. I have a feeling we're going to come back to that topic again, maybe in just a little bit. But um, I know our audience is interested to hear about you and more of your experience at 23 and Me. Um, so uh, maybe we can start to segue a, a little conversation around that. Um, 23andMe is known um, for being one of the first to implement autosomal DNA testing. Uh, they provide tailored health information coupled with um, some ancestral information. And right down in the genetic level, I went reading up on it. It's pretty impressive stuff. Um, as head of CI, um, let's start broadly, Eric. Can you uh, give us an explanation? How does 23andMe do this exactly? Um, how does it work? If I'm a yeah, customer it's a great... and I, excuse me, and I buy one of those kits, how does it work? <laughs> it's, it's a great question. Um, and this is the point where if in non-COVID times, I was standing in front of the class, I'd say, raise hands, who's had DNA testing? And then what were your motivations behind that? But since we're limited on the Zoom front, I'll just assume that very few of you have because um, based on age, less of the target market because we're not talking about a $9 test. These are more expensive. Our health and ancestry, which is um, one of our, our main product basically, retails at about $200. But, you know, hey, we've got Mother's Day coming up. It goes on sale. Um, and Father's Day. Um, I'm giving away uh, state secrets here, but uh, that's not a real shocker. Anyway, um, what do you get out of that? And I'll tell you one thing that's fascinating from a consumer insights standpoint. Well, I should give you more of the company line and also start with a disclaimer. We are in the unique situation where we're going to be going public here in a couple of months. So I got to be very limited on things that I can um, talk about, but I can broadly talk to most, most consumers think of DNA testing when they hear about it, they think, oh yeah, that's the thing that I um, you know, can get. They'll do my DNA in some way and they'll be able to tell me where my great grandparents are from. And yes, we, can, we think of it as two different worlds. So there's the ancestry world, the genotype, uh, I mean, the, um, so it's understanding your background and your family history. And we do that. In fact, all, we've got a crack group that does this in so many ways that I never even thought about. Um, 
And then the other half of the business is our health business, because that's really our specialty and what we focus on as far as giving the greatest benefit to our customers. And that's understanding how your DNA maps to your health and, and in so many ways. In fact, uh, the more that I've come to understand this, because obviously I'm on the market research side, not one of the science people, and about half of our staff are white labbed PhD scientists and genetics, genetics um, that uh, we will look back on this in three to five years and say, oh, remember those crazy stone age days when you used to just go into the doctor and they didn't understand how your health and your DNA intertwined and they were doing things like prescribing medication or rehabilitation and things without understanding that, oh, based on your genetics, actually based on your DNA profile, we should be adjusting this in certain ways. And there are many products that are going to be coming out over the next year that will make you understand that like, wow, I was taking this prescription all wrong because they never took this into account. And it does so many different things, not just on improving your health. I sound like I'm doing a sales pitch, but I'm kind of evangelist the more I've become knowing it. Um, just to give you an example, um, and I was just in a meeting with the therapeutics group, um, we take all of our information once your DNA is mapped and we um, anonymize it. In other words, it's no longer attached to your name and we put this into a pool. Well, now we've got about 12 million people. Once you start getting that kind of a basis together, you can start pulling together and understand that people with these variants, oh my God, they are so much more likely to have type two diabetes or Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. There is an endless list of different things where we can start being able to identify it and say, hey, John, now that we've done this, we show you as an elevated risk for X, Y, and Z, all these different conditions, you need to be doing X, Y, and Z or talk to your doctor or some of it's kind of immediately. And that is where it becomes super useful and actionable for the consumers. I'm, and I'll bring up one, um, uh, a great example of that, this thing that no one's ever heard of called um, hemochromatosis, which if uh, let's say you knew anyone, John, with a probably an Irish background, you're extremely susceptible to this. And what this is in layman's terms is too much iron in your blood. And it can have a lot of uh, effects, side effects, and it can, uh, or, um, the way it would manifest itself oftentimes is minor, it's lethargic and or problems like that. But it's still, it can get to a point where it's actually fatal um, in roughly about, I think it's 10 to 15,000 people in the US a year. Now with this DNA test, it can immediately say, John, you're at elevated risk, you need. And here's the great part about this one. And that's why I pull it up is because um, the solution for that is giving blood. If you give blood on like a, not even that often, um, it basically cures that problem for you. Um, so anyway, cool. these are the types of things that we can identify and make a meaningful impact into people's life. And the other big one is on the whole, I mean, we've all heard about the whole pharma, um, uh, the lengthy process that it takes to get a drug developed in a, in the pharmaceutical world. It's seven years typically from when we were like, Hey, we've got an idea to when it actually gets to market seven years and roughly $3 billion, which is why the drug development is only happening with a couple of extremely big companies. Um, what we can do with us is roughly cut that in half as far as the timeline and also as far as the expense. So um, we are creating efficiencies where there were uh, some real problems before. And that's a benefit to everybody in society. We'll be able to get new um, drugs out there to the people that actually need them in a way. All right, I've been rambling a little bit here. I'll back. No, no, no. That that's fascinating stuff. Just to finish up with your analogy with the, hey, I'm a patient, go see a doctor. So then, what you're implying is perhaps sometime down the road, I go in and see my doctor, and rather than just uh, him or her, you know, taking my blood pressure and then giving me a prescription, might do those same steps, but then might say, hey, John, here's a prescription for X, Y, Z, but because of your background. I'm giving you a 50% dose, by the way, I'm not, I'm just making this up. I'm giving you a 50% dose because that's all your body needs. Is that kind of what you're implying? Yes. You've taken it to that next step. And that's actually, you're describing our next product coming out. It's pharmacogenetics, which will actually match and give it actually down to brand names of different medications saying, 
based on this, and if you're thinking about taking this medication, you need to actually take more of it because you're, you're somewhat resistant to it or tolerant to it or take way less because you're probably going to be super sensitive to it. So it'll be those types of things that will become very common in our everyday healthcare. Um, and we'll be looking back on this and God, remember those days when they used to just say, yeah, take two of these and like everyone's yeah. the same. Um, but yeah, that's, that's going to be one of those things that we're going to all have to take more ownership of our healthcare in by the year within less than 10 years, there's going to be a shortage by about 120,000 of medical doctors in the United States alone. And who's going to pick up that slack. It's going to have to be technology and people taking more ownership of their health care. And we plan to be a big part of that. Well, uh, talking about kind of the future and 23andMe's role, um, getting back to you and I'll call it the consumer insights team at 23andMe, mm -hmm. without asking you to divulge any secrets, you let us know that you're in the midst of, you know, perhaps going public, et cetera. But without going that far, can you share with our audience maybe some of the questions or opportunities that your team are wrestling with or digging into on behalf of your company now? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I had spent most of my career in e-commerce and I didn't realize getting into the healthcare field like 23andMe is in. Um, the level of security and there is a very different um, hurdle, I guess you have to clear with the consumers when you're getting them to maybe purchase something like a photo book because you're working at Shutterfly versus when you're talking to them about giving the most personal thing you can, which is basically your DNA and giving them an opening and then asking to match all the other types of things. Cause we ask a lot of questions, you know, do you suffer from this? Do you have, an, and things that you wouldn't even think about. So a whole different level of uh, security and trust that you need to have with the consumers and, um, and also from a consumer insights, I mean, just a practical matter on what we have to do. We have to be very careful about how we ask things and, um, and what kind of information we can um, ask. Because for instance, I'll give you an example. If we're doing a study and we ask people about, oh, do you suffer from any of these following things? And someone starts indicating stuff like they're having serious health problems, we have a obligation not to be just like looking at it in the data points, be like, oh, looks like somebody's in really bad shape there. No, we have to do something about that. We can't just put that in the data set. And, and also if someone, it looks like uh, they may be having suicidal thoughts, things like that. So it, it's changed things in ways that I had not anticipated coming over to this segment. Um, but I think that it's also like thinking about it like a consumer product in many ways. There are many things that we have to overcome, um, it, but it is different. Like, for instance, I was telling you, most people still think about what we do as, oh yeah, it's that thing that tells me about my great-grandparents, um, which we do, but it's like, how do you educate? And, and I always use the analogy with your marketing slogan, better be able to fit on a, a bumper sticker. And everything that I've said about all these benefits about health and everything else does not fit on a bumper sticker, even the biggest bumper sticker out there. What does is, you know, find out. And that's been the dominant narrative with the media has been all about, oh, these, you know, twins discovered each other or people found their long lost father or whatever it is. And that makes for great press, but it also educates everyone to thinking that that's what DNA testing is. And so as a market researcher, how are we able to think about getting those benefits to, to get people to understand because it's an education issue. And, um, and that, that remains an issue we're able to, but it also means a much longer um, purchase funnel and purchase cycle um, for people. So anyway, it, it's, it's fascinating. It's interesting. And that's actually, I'll, I'll do a plug for those people that are just kind of, eh, should I do this as a career? One of the best things about it is that it is always learning. And if you have that kind of a personality, you will always be surprised. And speaking to someone who's been doing this for a long time, every time I start getting cocky and thinking like, I know how this is going to turn out and we're doing a study, but I already know the answers. I'm always humbled by it because we're talking about humans and things change all the time and perceptions and what drives them, the motivators it's always different and, and always fascinating. So it's always keeping me very interested. Never gotten bored in this business. 
I was going to say, you, uh, you get paid and you have a very cool job, Eric. Um, let's, uh, thanks for the insight into 23andMe. For a moment, I'm going to ask you to pull back for a second. And uh, my next question isn't just from 23andMe's perspective. It's more as you, you've worked in consumer insights. And so you inherently, your job is to take the perspective of the consumer and bring it to your company. So on behalf of consumers everywhere out there, um, should uh, we as consumers, should we be worried of sharing um, you know, our intrinsic personal information, be it with companies like 23andMe or Ancestry.com or some other company that isn't <clears throat> even part of today's conversation. Yeah. Um, should, should we be concerned about that? Um, what would you tell us? It, it's a great question. Um, I, so I feel that um, there are a certain segment of the population because we do segmentations, um, that are very vocal as far as saying, no, 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 I am not giving, you know, that's like, you guys have that information. It's going straight to the FBI and, uh, things like that. Um, I'll speak for our company that, uh, we've gone, we're kind of the gold standard as far as protecting data. And, um, as soon as we have your DNA and we start comparing it with other things, it is decoupled from any, um, uh, identifier. So it's anonymous, um, so, but there are still a lot of people that are concerned with it, um, that, oh, once you've got my DNA, you've got, well, we, we keep that all completely separate. And, it, and these oftentimes are the same people I'm like, but don't you have a, uh, a cell phone that you carry around all day that gives way more information? <laughs> and don't you use Google, which gives a ton of information on who you are, what you look, and Facebook and all that. Um, so it's a great point. I think people oftentimes are, um, following whatever is the latest in the news as far as things you should be concerned about. Um, everything that I've seen and having worked in Silicon Valley for a long time, DNA is way, way, way down on the list of things that you need to be concerned about as far as sharing personal information or how it might be used against you. Um, uh, and I'll give an, a little anecdote on it. So uh, if you've heard of how DNA has been used to capture serial killers, um, and I hear that at cocktail parties, oh, wow, you guys are giving, it's like, no, that was, that's an open source um, thing. It's not 23andMe where people can actually um, volunteer to put their DNA in there and then they triangulate it into figuring out who is. And then I always say for people who are using that as a uh, barrier to purchase or they're concerned about it, I'm like, so if you have an uncle that you think is a serial killer, don't you want him caught? I mean, why are you really trying to protect him? Um, but anyway, it does get used for on the crime stuff, but we have always kept a, a, a wall up between us and law enforcement on saying like, no, 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 our customer stuff, if they want to give it to you, great, but we're not going to, we've never, that, that's not something that 23andMe ever does. Well, kind of, kind of, let me take that same question and flip it around. Um, you talked earlier about um, this um, growing, I'll call it database that um, your company's collecting 12 million users, et cetera. Um, are there ways that 23andMe has already found to use that for the benefit of our broader community? Or is it always just a 23andMe relationship? So our information is used for the development on treatments and cures of a variety of different things. We have active ones going on right now for ones that I'm personally very interested in and have been working on some of the stuff for like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's. Um, so we feel strongly that these are going to help both in treatments as well as coming up with cures. And eventually we're going to move towards, um, things like coming up with different, uh, prescriptions and things that can actually directly help people with, um, those. We're also very active on trying to uncover where the greatest need is, because as you can imagine, if you're a pharmaceutical, there's a lot more money in creating a Viagra than there is creating some, some of these very debilitating types of conditions and diseases that uh, apply to a smaller group. Well, if you're talking DNA, we can spot out people pretty quickly and uh, that are suffering from these certain things and see the genetic variation right away and advance treatment in those areas. So those are many ways that we're working on some of those things. Um, we're also 
making a, a big effort towards underserved minorities. Um, one of the things that's happened when we started doing DNA, the people that immediately jumped in and said, yes, here's my DNA. I'm very interested in that. It was 80% from Northern European backgrounds. Um, and a lot of that is just because of it's mostly happened in the United States. And also it's been an expensive product. It's not a, again, a $10 product. It's, um, so we are making outreaches to help um, raise up the levels of people that have been tested that are from underserved minorities. And that's one of the big projects I'm working on right now. Excellent. It's got to be one of the main reasons uh, you probably came to, 20, to work at 23andMe, right? Not only the business itself, but what the business might be able to do for the broader community. I think that's really, really cool. It's great. And I think that's why there's so many people that are dedicated and working at 23, right, May, because it's a very mission driven company that comes from the CEO all the way down. And it's, it is inspiring. And uh, um, I always say, though, to people that are starting off their career, that's great. Aim high, look for that kind of stuff. But remember, Tom Hanks started off doing bosom buddies. You don't always get to be like, that's the one. <laughs> you have to work your way up to, towards things that you can really believe in unless you're very lucky. Well, how about this? Before uh, I just have to make a, a quick observations. Maybe that's a little of a piece of DNA that 23andMe and USF shares, um, that outward or external focus helping others. So I think that's really, really cool. Um, we've talked some about your career at 23andMe. Uh, now uh, I want to ask a couple of questions really that go to the heart of our audience. A lot of the folks who are Zooming in today mm -hmm our students at USF, particularly our grad students, and particularly those either studying marketing or in our marketing intelligence program. So Eric, keeping in mind um, our aspiring marketers here at USF, I wonder if you can share your thoughts on the relative importance of marketing and research and, and or consumer insights within an organization. You know what I mean? So obviously organizations, different departments and functions, and you're in marketing research CI. What's, yeah. the, what's the importance of, what do you see as the importance of that group to within the whole organization? Um, and I'll just stop there. I'll put a question mark right there. Yeah, it's, uh, well, first off, as a good researcher, you should realize you're talking to a very biased respondent here. So I'm going to always say it's the most important uh, role in any company. Um, the reality is, though, it has varying levels of need, and that's partly dependent upon at what uh, stage of growth the company is in, and a lot of other things like where it's placed within the company and um, the personality from the CEO on down, and uh, whether or not they're open to listening to someone tell them that their baby is not as pretty as they think it is. <laughs> um, but the reality is, and this is why it's so important, I think, that you have this program in Silicon Valley, because this is the greatest need. A company that is at the very beginning stage, I'd say, you know, two people that are have an idea and they're working on their laptops at Starbucks, they probably don't need a consumer insights person on their team right now. Um, I always think of it once the company starts getting up to a point where, I don't know, they've got 100 employees or maybe even less, depends on the, the business. But anyway, they basically have a product that's starting to gain some traction. That's when they actually need consumer insights more than anything. And I think that the consumer insights role has an outsized importance because I, I still, I'm struggling to come up with a good analogy of what role it plays. But the closest I've got is kind of like a military intelligence. You want a really, the smartest group has got to be your military intelligence if you're, let's say, thinking about a military operation, someone to say, okay, five miles up ahead is the enemy and they've got no tanks or they've got a hundred tanks. Crucial information on what you're going to do and how you're going to be able to respond to not just competitors, but also create something that's actually going to have some traction. Um, and that's because so many founders, it's not just founders, I'd say almost everybody in uh, Silicon Valley is guilty of uh, what I call marketing through the mirror. And that's every morning they get up and they say, I think I know my customer. It looks a lot like that person who's looking at me right there in the mirror. And I know exactly what they want. And that's human nature. People will always be like, the consumer wants, and they'll say something that is essentially what they want. 
Um, and again, that's where the consumer insights person needs to be able to say, actually, this is the consumer that we're looking for. And that's why there's so many different startups that are designed for Silicon Valley engineers, typically men between the ages of 25 and 45. And it's like, I look at some of these things, I'm like, they did no research because if they understood and did that, they'd realize that's a very tiny little market that they're building this for. Or what's uh, what happens a lot in Silicon Valley is great ideas that actually there's a really good idea but they never did any research. So it's marketed really poorly, or if they had just made a couple of adjustments on it, and it sometimes just comes down to the messaging and, and that can make or break a, uh, a great product. Um, conversely, I always say that there, nothing will kill a bad product faster than good marketing. So <laughs> like, this is how we market it. And this is the best way to do it. I've, I've been on some of those projects and you attract a lot of people that then show up and be like, yeah, the product's not that great. Um, and it's like, well, you know, we did our part on the marketing, the, the product then needs to be better. But long story short, um, I think that uh, it plays an outside role in Silicon Valley, which is why it's so exciting that you guys have a program going on here. There's a uh, tremendous demand, whether or not most of Silicon Valley understands that. Well, hopefully over time they will, but just connecting a couple of your two talking points, uh, it sounds like Consumer Insights, it may not have a lot of authority, but it certainly has a lot of importance in an organization, if I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah, and I think that it will over time. And I, I, you know, the arc has come. When I started early on, like I uh, I interviewed early days at uh, Google and uh, they were still... I don't want to say a startup, but they were in their earlier stages and they did not understand, at least most of the people I was interviewing with did not understand really the role and what I could do. And the closest they would come would be a UX thing. They'd be like, oh, you're the one who's going to tell us whether or not this should be on this part of the page or up here or what color it needs to be. And I'm like, eh, that's user experience research. It's important, but it's different than what we actually do. Um, so it has evolved a lot now. Google has a very robust um, consumer insights team that does some really cutting edge stuff. Um, so I, I think that some of the um, evolution of that and, and the thinking has certainly evolved, but um, you know, it, it can go. But so I think it's, it is actually a great time to be in this career and to have this kind of a program because the demand is really strong. I mean, I get recruited for all sorts of things and, and I see with the peers that everyone's in demand, it's kind of a, what we're all saying, like, yeah, we're looking for somebody who isn't on, you know, that's got some experience and knows how to do all these different things. Well, I'm just kind of um, uh, leaping off that last comment about uh, demand and jobs. What I'd like to do now, Eric, is introduce um, one of our marketing intelligence graduate students, uh, right. Trinity Calpacetti. Um, Trinity uh, polled some of her peers who are studying right now at USF, and I believe Trinity has one or two questions for you. Maybe we can hear from her now. Hi, Eric. My name is Trinity Copacetti. I'm a student in the MSMI program, and I'm also the current president of the Graduate Marketing Club here at USF. First off, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to come speak with us. We really appreciate it. I have two questions for you today. My first question is, what advice might you give young professionals who want to make a career in market research and insight? And my second question is, what are some of the key skills or experiences you look for in early to mid-career marketers that aspire for your kind of work? Thank you so much. Um. Shinny, great questions. Uh, I'll try and be concise because this is one that could go on for quite a bit. Um, so career advice, best career advice for someone with that um, is to, um, first of all, network. And that can mean a couple of different things. So network within your own class because um, you, these are people, hopefully, that you make some good connections with and some friendships, and they will, hopefully, if they're a smart group, they will all be advancing and they will be great contacts for you throughout your career. And oftentimes, 
they will be knowing someone saying, Hey, I just got called from a recruiter. There's this great job. I'm tied down with my job and I love my job right now, but I thought of you because you are perfect. And this is something that's a passion of yours. So I'm going to connect you guys. And that's the way a lot of your um, uh, opportunities will come along later in your career. Um, and then there's the other networking, which is talking to um, professionals that are already in the business, um, whether or not they have jobs open opening, because it's good to be on their um, on their radar. So when they do have a, a, an opening, or they could, you know, within my peer, I know a lot of people that are heads of different research groups, and uh, we always talk about when we're looking for someone and who we're looking for. So it's great to be plugged in that way. So networking is strong, and then. Um, Let's see, your second question was around key skills. Um, I think it depends on what you want to do. If you are a statistical whiz, there are companies and positions where they'll be like, we were looking for somebody who's got all those smarts and we're gonna get you to work on that. Um, or if you have a passion for something that's more like entertainment or healthcare or e-commerce or, or sports and fitness, um, that is always a bonus and a great way to um, introduce yourself on one of those. I'm applying for this, or I'd love to talk to you about this because I have a passion for this and being able to back it up by saying, you know, whatever um, the story is behind that. And actually that's, that's actually another key skill I'll throw in there is not just being able to take the data and say, well, this is what the data says. Um, I think that a really successful consumer insights person is able to craft a story um, because data on its own is generally pretty boring. Um, being able to shape several different things and connect the dots, that's when people become really valuable. And that doesn't happen overnight. You're going to, I mean, it takes, I'm still learning how to do that. Um, and times where it doesn't come to me till, you know, I'm walking out after a big presentation. I'm like, oh, you know, I should have put that and that together. That would have really been, uh. um, so it's an ongoing thing. You, you, you will learn, I would say the other key skill here before I forget is um, diplomacy. And this goes to what John and I were just talking about where you have tremendous responsibility with no authority. So you have to be a nice person. <laughs> so, and this also goes for networking. If you're not a nice person, you're probably not gonna get a lot of great networking and people will say, oh yeah, that person, uh, yeah, they're really smart, but not very easy to work around. So play nice with others is uh, a great skill, but also necessary because this role by its nature is not, it's interdepartmental. So you have to be able to seamlessly go from talking marketing with the marketing people, talking product with the product people, engineering, and then shift over and talk to the, um, the people in charge of communications or PR and understand what their needs are. And that's why part of it is being moderator. Even if you're never gonna moderate, you have to understand like, who am I talking to right now? What are they trying to say? So listening is the biggest thing. And then also um, being a soundboard. So trying to rephrase and say, what I'm hearing is X, Y, and Z. This is what you actually need. And they'll be like, yeah, yeah, that's actually it. And that's part of what you're doing all the time where um, uh, I always say, so many of my conversations start off with somebody, some head of engineering says, hey, we need to do focus groups. And I was always like, red flag, red flag, stop right there, stop. Let's not talk about methodology. Tell me, what is your issue? What is your problem? What is the thing that you would love to have an answer? In fact, let's pretend um, we have a time machine and we're speeding up, let's say a month or two, and I am now delivering what? What is it that's making your life better? And they're like, oh, well, I wish you could tell me why people aren't doing this and what we need to do to X, Y, Z. Okay, now we've understood what the problem is. Now let's start talking about different ways we can approach this and X, Y, and Z. And I'd also say, uh, now I'm really rambling here. <laughs> One of the most important things in the role is the ability to say no, because everybody is going to ask you um, questions. And there's kind of an arc of um, being familiar and working within a team where they don't know quite what to ask you to do or what your purpose is. And then once you really perform, this is the, when your problems start. They're like, that was great. We're gonna start throwing every question at you. And you have to be able to say like, y you know what, this one, you should probably just figure that one out on your own. Or, uh, you know what, we did some studies a while ago and based on this, I think your answer is no, don't do this or whatever it is. 
um, because otherwise you're going to just be buried in doing unnecessary studies. All right, now I'll stop rambling there for a second. Is that, did that kind of answer some of the questions? Yeah, uh, Eric, I think you uh, nailed Srini's questions really, really well. Um, and uh, don't worry, you're not rambling. We're actually, um, we're actually learning lots um, uh, over these last several minutes. Um, but how about this? In the interest of time, we are, Eric and I are going to start heading towards uh, the end of our conversation today. If there are any questions um, out there in the audience, uh, please feel free to uh, put those in the chat box. If we have time, we'll get to them. But um, Eric, as we, before we start to wrap up, um, maybe I could uh, ask you to play a little uh, bit of that um, looking into a crystal ball. You were just talking about hopping into a time machine just a second ago. Um, if you had to guess, as you look forward, let's say one, three, five years out, do you see the field of marketing research and insights and analytics becoming more important, less important? Um, bear with my question for just a moment. It, it, you almost can't pick up a newspaper or a Reddit article without hearing or, uh, or seeing big data, uh, big data analytics, machine learning, AI. It almost makes me think that, is there even a future for what we do? Do companies even need consumer insight? So take that as some form of a question and I'm going to lob it over in your direction. What do you think and what do you see coming down the road? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I would use the analogy that it is like saying, look at all this technology that's coming along uh, in the medical um, field. Doctors are no longer necessary. Well, of course, doctors are going to be necessary. And you're still going to, because it's around interpretation. As great as AI gets and as... Uh, as useful as many of the tools are, the ones in this field actually become more important because they're like, well, we sunk a ton of money into these things. Now somebody needs to tell us what this actually says or does. And, and that's why I think that a course like what you're um, doing over there is so important because uh, you can teach people to um, you know, put together and, and read data or, or construct a questionnaire. And that's all, those are all really important. Um, skills to master, but the real, what's going to make you special in this industry and indispensable to an organization is being able to interpret that and also being able to put it into action. And I'll tell you why, because one of the biggest complaints that people will have, well, A, research always takes too long and B, it, it costs more, but that's a whole nother topic because prices actually have come down. And I still think, you know, there's a lot of great studies out there that say for every $1 spent on market research is a savings that you get seven dollars back oftentimes it's from saying like don't don't build this multi-million dollar project because it's going to be a failure anyway and then um the third one is that the um so it's it takes too long costs too much and it's not actionable is the third one it's like you're telling me something but now i, I don't what do i do with this I, I this is not so it's being able to actually take these results and then say Based on this, this is our recommendation on what you need to do. And people are like, ah, oh, that's great. Uh, this is why I always go back to you guys because you guys are so smart and you always tell us these are the things that we should do. They don't always do it, but um, you're making yourself extremely uh, important and valuable to the organization. I would say that the other thing is that these, what used to be very hard lines on, no, this is market research and you stay within your lane. These lines are going to become much more fluid. And I think that that's good for the successful professionals in this organization, in this field, because um, you're going to have to get into more of what we call comp intel or competitive intelligence and understand strategy. So it's not just like, this is what our customers say, and this is what we're going to do. No, it's like understanding that there is another brand out there that is our big competitor, and this is what they're doing differently. In fact, I've gone out and tried their product, and this is what I'm seeing. And now we're actually doing studies where we're having some of our customers try this product. And you know what they say? They're saying that they do this and this better than So it's understanding and being able to pull it. Now you become... Uh, someone who's so much more valuable, you're a strategy person, not just um, repeating back some of the data on customer research. And it goes into a lot of the different things. So like I, I have a passion for um, uh, PR or communications. 
And so I'm always looking at how different things, uh, different companies are reacting to different things. And I try and incorporate that into my presentations on saying like, well, companies that have been through similar things, they reacted this way. This is how our consumers are likely to react if we go down this path. So it's going to evolve, it's going to change, but I think it's all in great ways for um, people that are going to be agile. Excellent. Um, Eric, I'm, I'm sorry to say, I think we're getting close to our time to wrap up. Um, I know, by the way, Eric, we've had some questions in the chat box. I, I didn't interrupt you. I'm hoping that I'll just say uh, you're not committed to this. I'm just uh, hoping that we might be able to have part two of this conversation, who knows, six months or a year from today. Um, There's a lot of interest uh, from our audience. Also gained a lot of insights from you, sir, today. Um, uh, talking about uh, your last comment, you know, those that get in this field, you're not just getting into consumer insights, you're becoming a strategist. It's not just about the numbers, it's also about the interpersonal components that you talked about. Um, and then obviously, um, we can't be rigid, but we need to be flexible in our thinking. So um, I think we've taken uh, a, lot, uh, a lot of good nuggets away from our conversation. Um, maybe uh, uh, one last uh, 20 seconds like they do on the news sure. programs. As we wrap up, is there uh, one final thought, piece of advice for our audience, or maybe just something that I didn't, uh, we didn't cover in our conversation today that you just wanna uh, put in people's minds? Um, it's maybe a bit redundant on kind of the theme I was saying, but I think it's a really exciting time um, I think that uh, for the people that are smart and agile, you're going to have a potentially a very fulfilling career. Um, I think of it as the best job in any business in any company because I've, I've, you need to have a very curious mind. Um, it also helps, well, at least for me, because I have a short attention span. So I like to tell people, this is what you need to do. And I love to learn new things, but then I don't like, I don't have the patience or the discipline to actually work on that project for 18 months, which some people, that's what they love doing. That's where their rewards are. So I can tell them, this is what you guys need to do on this. And then I'm off to the next thing. So if that appeals to you, a great career, it's uh, one of the few ones that um, you kind of get rewarded for having a short attention span. Um, but, uh, plus you get to talk about everything. So you always sound smart at cocktail parties. So that's an added bonus. There you go. I love it. Well, how about this? I think it's about time for us to wrap up today's session. Um, firstly, um, Eric, on behalf of all of us at USF, uh, sincerely, thank you very much, um, for taking time out of your day to share, um, not only some of your professional experiences, but your personal insights as well. Um, fascinating conversation and we're very appreciative oh pleasure's mine john um and to our listeners if there's anybody out there uh that uh came away from uh, our conversation with eric rasmussen today with a renewed interest in the field of marketing research or insights we invite you to investigate our msmi program here at usf or to reach out to us um i think uh, someone's probably putting that in a text box someplace as I speak. It's at usfca.edu slash MSMI. Sorry, that's my little co commercial blurb. We'd love to hear from you. And finally, to uh, our audience, right? Uh, to our many students, alumni, and guests who took time out of the day to Zoom in and join us. Thank you very much. Again, Eric, thank you very much. And everyone have a great day. Take care. Thanks, Chad.